So, hello everyone. Good. <laughs> Hopefully you're refreshed and uh, sort of ready to, to continue the conversation. I do want to start though by, by you know, thanking the, um, the people here at Wit De Wit and um, also, you know, for, for hosting me and for the work that you did to put, put this um, together. Also, Nana, um, thank you for this, for um, the brilliant curation in the um, gallery. I think if you haven't seen the show, I definitely do recommend it. It's, it's quite something. And now that I've heard both of the other speakers, I can see that you did a good kind of curatorial job with <laughs> bringing the three of us here too. And I think you, hopefully you all will see what I mean after you hear what I have to say. So my own contribution is about 30 minutes long. Um, and I think you'll hear in it echoes of Alex's presentation. Um, and I, I think it picks up on some things um, also that uh, Don was talking about. Um, and I'm also struck, I just have to say, that um, in this talk I make references to ships and to boats. And walking over here, I was struck at how present those are here in all the kind of uh, history that those carry as well. So, to begin. <coughs> so let's start with Sun Ra. Sun Ra is best known as an innovator of free jazz, who created his own cosmology, eschewing his given name and place of birth, which was Herman Blount, born in 1914 in Birmingham, Alabama, taking the name Sun Ra and claiming to be from Saturn. Though he was an eccentric jazz musician, his interest in outer space and unconventional musical expressions can be felt in later musical endeavors, such as George Clinton um, and Parliament Funkadelic, Diggable Planets, and Public Enemy, among many others. It also finds a filmic expression in the, film, uh, in the 1974 film, Space is the Place, featuring Sun Ra and one of his bands, the Orchestra. At the beginning of Space is the Place, Sun Ra's character announces that he wants to set up a colony for black people on another planet to see what they can do on a planet all their own without any white people there. About that utopian aim, he states, equation-wise, the first thing to do is to consider time as officially ended. We'll work on the other side of time. We'll bring them here through either isotopic teleportation, transmolecularization, or better still, teleport the whole planet here through music. The rest of the film involves Sun Ra's character playing a game of cards with a character called um, the Overseer to win a bet for control over the destiny of black people and traveling in the United States between Chicago, Illinois in 1943 and Oakland, California in 1969, trying to convince black people to go to that planet with him. The film ends with Sun Ra defeating the Overseer and setting into motion an altered destiny. The first words that Sun Ra utters in Space is the Place are offered as he surveys the planet he has discovered. The music is different here. The vibrations are different not like planet Earth, right? So I've just described this, but you really actually have to see it to, to, to get the feel for it. So, so the first image um, uh, from Space is a Place is a kind of phallic uh, spaceship um, floating across a black screen. It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world.
music is different here. The vibrations are different. Not like Planet Earth. Planet Earth's sound of guns, anger, frustration. There was no one to talk to from Planet Earth to understand. We set up a colony of black people here. See what they can do on the planet all their own without any white people there. They could drink in the beauty of this planet. It would affect their vibrations for the better, of course. Another place in the universe, up under different stars. That would be where the altar destiny would come in. Equation-wise, the first thing to do is to consider time as officially ended. We work on the other side of time. We bring them here through either isotope teleportation, transmolecularization, or better still, teleport the whole planet here through music. At the beginning, and then again somewhere in the middle of the film Space is the Place, Sun Ra's band begins to play a tune that Alex mentioned called It's After the End of the World. The tune launches forth with tentative tones and sounds, then come lyrics that contain only a refrain sung and shouted in a voice that today we recognize as feminine. Over and again, she says insistently, it's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? It's after the end of the world. One of the refrains of Space is the Place, it's after the end of the world, don't you know that yet, is an assertion of another temporality in different coordinates, both of which exist within but are incommensurate with those taken to be the dominant logics of ex existence. A world, only one, characterized by predictability, temporal continuity, and coherence. The feminine voice creates a refrain, a calming and stabilizing, calm and stable center in the heart of chaos which insists that it is after the end of the world. It jumps from chaos to the beginnings of order in chaos and is in danger of breaking apart at any moment. This refrain open, opens a marvelous impossibility. The world does not cohere as such. If it once did, it no longer does. Already it has ended. Whatever existence we can claim, whatever that can be claimed, wherever that can be claimed, and however it can be characterized, cannot be taken... Um, I'm sorry, let me start that over. Whatever existence we can claim, wherever it can be claimed, and however it can be characterized, cannot take the continuity and stability of a world as axiomatic. Soon after it re begins, the refrain in space is the place, it's after the end of the world, don't you know that yet? Is overtaken by other sounds, another attempt to organize chaos. Perhaps the limited space organized by these sounds is not music, but a wall of sound, a loud yet fragile. It collapses and leaves us homeless. Homelessness is our home. We carry the abyss that Edouard Glissant characterized so well. The middle passage of the transatlantic slave trade and the formation of a new world marks an apocalyptic catastrophe. We are forged in its wake. We 
with specific reference to the Caribbean, Glissant explains, the abyss is also a projection of and a perspective onto the unknown. This is why we stay with poetry. We know ourselves as part and as crowd. In an unknown that does not terrify, we cry our cry of poetry. Our boats are open and we sail them for everyone. And I think Alex reminded us um, also very nicely of how we might situate the danger, violence, and drama of the boats sailing um, on the Mediterranean right now within this longer arc um, of the phenomenon that Lissant is, is talking about. At home in open boats and spaceships, launching for the unknown, we hum the refrain, it's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? Homeless at home, we improvise. The soundtrack of Space is the Place segues into Under Different Stars. Cosmic forces are perceptible, even as the earthly forces of the abyss linger and are transduced into another world. Here, now, in the world some believe is just one. The soundtrack and image track of Space is the Place, the matter on which they are recorded, and the discourses that circulate about it, in other words, all that comprises Space is the Place, melds with that world, which is not a just one opening that world all the way to a point where we can believe in it again. And it leaves us with only a belief in that world. In the spirit of improvisation, therefore, I offer the poetic formulation of the sonic refrain found at the beginning and again in the middle of space's place because it makes perceptible a logic of futures and futurity that stymies the conventional organization of time and space that authorizes a linear progressive narrative and a linear progressive concept of time in which the present precedes the future for which it is determined to become the past. Sun Ra's in interventions in Space is the Place, as well as his performances and recordings of free jazz, are perhaps best contextualized within the broader socio-cultural, political, and economic context of the struggles against Jim Crow segregation and, black, and for black power and pan-Africanism as those were innovated and expressed in the United States throughout the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. In an essay entitled, Appropriating the Master's Tools, Sun Ra, the Black Panthers, and Black Consciousness, 1952 to 1973, for instance, Daniel Kreese argued that space as a place should be understood, at least in part, as Sun Ra's response to the performative politics of the Black Panther Party and especially their emphasis on community organizing and community programs as a way of undermining the authority of the United States. So this is another clip from Space is the Place. I want to show it to you because I think it offers an element of Sun Ra's um, uh, overall argument that is relevant to what I want to say next regarding the film. And this is from halfway in the film. Oh man, this man's gonna run hard on me. Man, that's a trip still. You got some It's not worth it. All right, take it over, fellas. Yeah. Greetings, Black You. Planet Earth. What it is, what it is. I am Sunra, ambassador from the intergalactic regions of the Council of Outer Space. Why are your shoes so big? Are those moon shoes? How do we know you for real? Yeah, how do we know you ain't somebody off telegraph street, some old hippie or something? <laughs> 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 
What are you? I mean, we don't know that. Is he for real? He might have something going for him. Yeah, we showed them. Oh, what's that? What kind of shoes is that you got on your feet? Yeah, walking around all these funny clothes. Shoot, I know I'd probably take off running. I seen somebody walking down the street coming, talking all that mess to me, talking about going to outer space. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. what it is? Yeah. That's what it is. What it is? Hey. 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 We don't know what you are. <laughs> How do you know I'm real? Yeah. I'm not real. I'm just like you. You don't exist in this society. If you did, your people wouldn't be seeking equal rights. You're not real. If you were, you'd have some status among the nations of the world. So we're both myths. I do not come to you as a reality. I come to you as the myth, because that's what black people are, myths. <laughs> I came from a dream that the black man dreamed long ago. I'm actually a present sent to you by your ancestors. I'm going to be here till I pick out certain one of you to take back with me. What if we won't come? You going to make us come? Then I'm going to have to do you like they did you in Africa. Chain you up, take you with me. Are there any whiteies up there? They're walking there today. That's right. They take frequent trips to the moon. I notice none of you have yeah. been invited. How do you think you're going to exist? The year 2000 is right around the corner. What's that crystal thing in your hand? Space age. We're living in the space age. Space age. We're living in the space age. Space age. We're living in the space age. Space age. No matter who. So In Space is the place Sun Ra suggests that community programs and the aestheticized politics of the Black Panther Party and other black radicals of the time only go so far in addressing the fundamental socioeconomic inequalities that keep the souls of black folk from taking flight into the cosmos. What is necessary instead, Sun Ra argues, is a fundamental rupture in black people's consciousness. Their vibrations, a vibrational rupture in consciousness that is capable of creating a new world in a new spatio-temporal configuration. Sun Ra argues further that sound, music, can spark that rupture. He offers his improvisational compositions as a means through which an energetic transformation can occur, stripping black folk of their belief that they are black, of their investment in the ontological coherence of blackness, whether as positive or negative, Sun Ra reveals that the historical condition of black folks is in existence as living things among other things. In Space is the Place, Sun Ra articulates important aspects of his thinking about on this point, ones that make Sun Ra's project as far out as it seems relevant to con current contemporary current conversations about the articulation of a politics given the persistence of what some describe today as forms of social and psychic death, such as those characteristic of the prison industrial complex or contemporary geopolitics that target black people and people of color, diminishing our life chances and rendering us vulnerable to premature death, even as the theoretical interventions into the assumed coherence of racial categories, such as the acknowledgments of the social construction of race, become more widely accepted. At the same time, I invoke Sun Ra's refrain from Space is the Place in order to illustrate how that film invokes and enacts a spatiotemporal logics that are consistent with those that animate black existence in a world that is not a just one. The refrain, it's after the end of the world, anchors a present that is, as Joy James put it recently with reference to Frantz Fanon, the henceforward. The quote that James refers to is from Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, where he writes, quote, henceforward the interests of one will be the interests of all. It, for in concrete fact, everyone will be discovered by the troops, everyone will be massacred, or everyone will be saved, end of quote from Fanon. Though there are differences in the ways that the spatiotemporal logics have been engaged in black studies, I think we are all after and within a shared concern. Sadia Hartman has referred to this as the afterlife of slavery, and I have offered in the interval as a way to formulate a present still suspended in ongoing violences of white supremacy and the socioeconomic logics of racial capital put into motion by the transatlantic slave trade, 
the colonization of Africa, Asia, and what the Europeans saw as their new world. Other scholars have turned to Freudian formulations of melancholia as a way to conceptualize the structure of feeling in which a traumatic past, colonization, settler colonialism, um, enslavement, continually pervade, pervades our present. The temporality that Sun Ra's refrain invokes is consistent with these more recent formulations, but rather than linger there, after the end of the world in the still fresh and powerful traumatic past through which the world ended, Sun Ra asserts that we must consider time to be officially ended, and we should head up to another planet under different stars. Where to begin without a past? Because life goes on. Life is going on. How to begin anew after the end of time when catastrophe is what lingers as time and future is what remains of temporality now? In a way that does not allow for something like melancholia to even take hold, Edward Glissant, writing from Martinique, and with an interest in the ongoing project of the Caribbean, gives us a formulation of the abyss as a way to name the temporality through which the Caribbean exists as such. In an in interview with Mantia Diawara, Glissant explains that we carry the dimension of the abyss inside of us because of the circumstances through which the Caribbean and the rest of the Europeans' new world was created. Glissant's notion of the abyss is central to his theory of the temporality of the Caribbean. As John E. Dabrowski points out, for Glissant, the Middle Passage marked a radical rupture for the Africans who survived it that has implications for their descendants and their ancestors. The trauma of the Middle Passage, the bodies of those newly enslaved thrown overboard to die an anonymous death at the bottom of the sea and then lost forever so that only their shackles remain. The continuity of languages and cultures and familial lines disrupted. The horror of living with the violences of objection to, for, and within white supremacy and its Western modernity. And all of the other everyday micro-terrors that we do not or no longer imagine today or that we have habituated ourselves to accept these traumas sever roots and pasts and histories. Even loss itself is stolen in the Middle Passage. Drabinsky explains, quote, for Glissant, the Caribbean is futurity precisely because of the abyssal effect and affect of loss. Impossible history is not the loss of what was, it is rather what it means to begin without even the memory of having once possessed. The middle passage is just this much violence and yet life goes on. At the shoreline then on the plantation which Glissant calls one of the wombs of the world in Poetics of Relation, the future is a kind of facticity, not a project. The name Caribbean it's, it's, is itself inseparable from the openness of what is to come. The future, insofar as it can be taken up, offers less than nothing as wreckage within which a movement to the future can take root. It's the end of the quote. When the future offers nothing less, th offers less than nothing as wreckage within which a movement to the future can take root, the subjectivity that emerges from the material conditions indexed by the name Caribbean is nomadic and multiple. But as Drabinsky states, quote, this is to say nomadic is not the qualifier of subjectivity as the result of a critique of metaphysics, nor does it respond to various epistemological paradoxes, end quote, as it does, and he's referencing here Deleuze and Guattari's nomad, for those of you who may know what that is, right? Drabinsky continues, quote, Glissant's nomad has another materiality and therefore another genesis, end quote. Abyss names Glissant's formulation of the conditions of possibility for Caribbean as futurity for, quote, what it means to begin without even the memory of having possessed, end quote. This points to the bifurcations and forks in temporality that have come to characterize Western modernity. It points to the queerness that is endogenous to time at the same time as it situates the abyss as a deeply creative dimension within black culture from which futures are taking flight. For Glissant, for example, it was the dimension of the abyss carried by the progenitors of jazz that allowed these musicians to create a new musical form, a black American musical form from which also can be understood as an extension of an innovation within African cultural forms 
even though the musician's historical connection and access to these forms had been severed. We might say then, and this is to quote Fred Moten one more time, just to round things out here, um, <laughs> along with Fred Moten then, that blackness is another name for black history. They are present now. In his book, In the Break, The Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition, Moten puts it this way. One of the implications of blackness is that those manifestations of the future in the degraded present that CLR James described can never be understood simply as illusory. The knowledge of the future and the present is bound up with something Marx, and that's Karl Marx, could only subjunctively imagine the commodity that speaks, the commodity who speaks. End of quote. The knowledge of the future and the present, the presence of black futures now, is bound up with those processes that make commodities of living beings and it marks that which remains fugitive within those processes. For Moten, the commodity that speaks both indexes the specific space times of chattel slavery and is bound up with the ongoing upheaval that is blackness. For Joy James, the concept of the henceforward that I mentioned earlier is a temporal anchor for the creation of what J James describes as, quote, the new being, the rebel intellectual who, through struggle and an internalization of the other, also becomes individual and collective in overt and covert rebellion, alive because everyone has now become mechanized in its rebellion, with, it, with the spiritual force of freedom driving it, biological, mechanical, divine." End quote. As with Glissant's abyss, the henceforward marks a creative, generative space-time within the ongoing colonization of the Americas that marks the afterlife of slavery. I take seriously James Sneed's proposition that within the spatio-temporal logics of our shared modernity, modernity, blackness is always there already. The transatlantic slave trade, colonization, and settler colonialism pressed living beings into things hundreds of years ago and the epistemological and ontological legacies of that world historical transmutation are still with us today. Opening ways to connect formulations of time and space that are generated out of a sustained engagement with those contexts in which living objects and breathing things exist might advance an ethics through which to anchor the just world breathing beneath our feet. We can listen for their refrains, rehearsed, improvised, even those we perceive as just noise, here and now, in these black futures. Thank you. So I want to give the floor again two questions for Kara before we are going to do the round table. Vivian. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, thanks Kara for a terrific presentation that was exciting and um, very thought provoking and so thought-provoking that it doesn't yet for me cohere into a question, so I hope this will be something that you can respond to. But um, within your introduction, Nana, you laid out an itinerary for us, which put us in some ways in the shadow of uh, thinking that is tied to a decolonial project. Um, and I'm interested in what that means also as a spatial temporal thinking. And I wonder what it means as to whether Blackness, as you've discussed it, is not um, associated with those for whom return is not an option, but is nonetheless a reality. Um, I hope that might be something to, to respond to, but could you specifically maybe relate to this in terms of uh, projects of decolonial politics as they are ongoing? Um, so I can try, right? Um, because I, I think that there are a variety of, you know, ways that, that I would 
think about decolonial projects, and there are ones I don't know of, you know, and don't know about, so I can't speak to those, but I would say sort of in general what I was interested in was thinking about um, not only the physical kind of return, right, like people who are stolen and who can't return, or people who are migrants and, and um, immigrants and all of these different sort of movements that constitute sort of a kind of global blackness or something, right? Um, but also thinking about, and this is actually, I think, picking up on the question um, that ended the last uh, presentation, but thinking about a kind of uh, um, dynamic change that's, that's ongoing. So this notion of like life going on and these things happening, and there being things that can still, even though they seem irretrievably lost, can somehow um, erupt in some moment, right? <laughs> so I think that a decolonial project, and many, I think, you know, this is a challenge of decolonial projects in some ways, is to think about what to do with what came before, <laughs> right? Any rupture, whether it's kind of colonization or enslavement or you know, these uh, movements of peoples, et cetera, how to think about the value and importance and ongoing force of what came before at the same time as acknowledging and trying to incorporate those things that are ongoing and moving, moving and perhaps even new and vital and really creative, right, now or as futures. Yeah, I, I was wondering, as a white person, how can we enter into the colonies as well? I mean, I, I think the future shouldn't be just black lives and white lives, but mixed lives. So how do we do that without, again, as whites, imposing too much? I mean, that's, I think, find that a very difficult issue because I'm very aware of the black matters, but I don't want to impose myself, but I do want us to, to mix together. Maybe, maybe this is a question where I can um, actually ask all the other speakers to the table and use the collectivity in the room. <laughs> but since the question was posed to you, Kara, I um, of course give you the first shot. <laughs> Okay, so um, first I would say, you know, thank you for the question, <laughs> right? I think um, my initial response is to say that um, part, of, part, of, part of what's involved with that is an actual dialogue with the people who are close to you in your, in your community, right? The people that you're actually in an ongoing kind of relationship with to learn how to be in relationship with them in a way that's not imposing. So I think, there, to me, there's a kind of interpersonal dimension to it um, that I think is really important for people to be doing as part of our practice of trying to learn to live together, <laughs> right? Um, the other thing I would say in the more theoretical vein is that I was not, and I hope that I did not say that I thought that the future was some sort of blackness that only people who are recognizably black today can belong to, but to say that there's an ethics that underlies the, the ways that black people, and I would say, you know, that this is true probably of, uh, of other subjugated people, right? Other people who find themselves in, in situations of like the ones we've been talking about, that there is a kind of ethics that comes from those experiences that might be the ethics that could animate a future that would be one that we could all actually live in. So I didn't intend to say, and I am glad to have the opportunity to clear up um, this up if, if, if I did come across as saying that, but I did not um, mean to say that there's only black people and white people in this black futures, right? But that there's some kind of ethics that's being generated now that um, might be 
something from which to launch a kind of um, way of being in the world with others. You want us all to answer it? So. No, no, no. Okay. Hello. Ah, yeah, good. Okay. Well, because um, this is actually great that you're picking up on the notion of ethics, because that's uh, one of the questions. And I mentioned earlier in the introduction that I was um, that I have more questions tonight than any answers, and this is actually an ongoing. A uh, very speculative uh, <laughs> conversation, but what could be the ethics that are actually deriving from that no space, no time, no place notion of um, non individuality um, non specificity etc maybe maybe um, Alex, you can answer to that um. <laughs> or are there ethics i'm also i'm particularly asking you. Because of your rereading of Agamben and your rereading of, um, of Foucault's biopolitics and your latest publication, where <coughs> you're actually using Hortense Billers and Sylvia Winter in order to um, create the case that not every um, subject has been included within this conceptualization of the human and what is the what are the ethics of of, of that humanity that um, you actually investigated in your book. Um, and I, I'll just build a little bit on um, what Kara was saying, um, and I, I think, and, and that was part of the, um, the project of that book, um, put very, very simply, was to think about the figure of the human starting with the slave and not the slave master, and kind of taking that as a model. And I, I think um, I see enactments of what you're calling um, um, ethics, but what we could also um, um, call um, um, culture, I mean, I see many other things too, um, within black life, right? That in some ways, um, what black life um, offers, and, um, and, and Horst Spillers in her more recent work has actually made the argument that that's something that's disappearing is actually a different way of relating to the world, which was born out of these various necessities, um, but nevertheless continues to reformulate itself and provide different kinds of models. I see that in jazz, I see that in hip hop, I see it in Jackie Kay, right? Um, I see it you know, um, in, in, in various other um, um, practices, and I, like I said, I see different forms of internalized and externalized violence too. It's not um, um, all of that. But I do think, given the position that black life um, was put in um, through all these, um, 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 through all these um, acts, discourses, institutions, technologies, um, and, and so on, that it has really developed a series of um, ways of being and relating to the world um, very, very um, 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 differently. And, and, and the problem seems to me that that is still seen as an aberration, right? As opposed to, and this is what I meant about uh, taking that one story from, from Kay, um, using that as a model of what we should actually emulate, as opposed to trying to emulate normative ideas about gender, family, and, um, um, and, 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 and belonging. It's all there, right? It's there in the Black Star Line. It's there in the um, um, voguing houses of Harlem and um, New Jersey, et cetera, and, um, um, and, 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 and so on. And I, I, I think, if I heard um, Kara correctly, that that's um, what you were, the argument you were making about the um, film and what Ra was saying about temporality and Don, what you were saying about form, right? Um, what those possibilities um, are. But I'll, I'll just stop there. Actually, I mean, I, I think that. Hello. Oh. <laughs> I think that, you know, in answer to like, I mean, I don't think there's an answer to that question that this, I don't, I couldn't see the woman who asked like, what can I do as a white person? You know, like, what can I do as a black person? What can I do as like, you know, anyone? Like, there's not really, I don't think like an, an answer to, about like a, a problem so large and kind of, you know, diffuse as the race problem 
like what can one person do like incrementally in, in one's own I mean like I think the answer would be like a false answer you know what I mean like you can you know if you if you're on the train and somebody says something fucked up and racist you can be like that's fucked up and racist you know like that's <laughs> that's I guess you can do that but I think that like the question of kind of like one's own like individual participation in the world in an ethical way like that's something that you can do and you'll feel good about that you know, is that really going to be, I mean, and I guess it's good to feel good, you know, about what you're doing in the world, um, and you have a kind of, like, impact in, like, you know, small ways, but, like, does that change the world? I don't know. <laughs> well, I think, can I just, I mean, just in response to this really briefly, I mean, part of the way that I come at this question is by thinking about the people I know, and these are like, you know, actual people, <laughs> right? So it's very like non-theoretical, right? But like um, people I know who are Southern white people who have, I think, done extraordinary things in relationship to addressing racism among the, their own people, <laughs> right? And I do think that that's a valuable kind of thing, and I think it's an individual thing it, to a certain extent, but I also think that there's a way that um, that it's important to al always also hang on to sort of like what embodiment can do, like what being, you know, in the, in the world in relationship to others in a world that's not set and fixed, right, in a world that is sort of being constituted through our participation in it, what that, what that does make possible. So I agree with you on, on the one hand, but I also think that I want to hold on to some sense in which we're kind of, you know, acting in and on the world and, and in and on each other in ways that are micro, that, mm -hmm. w that we don't know while we're doing it what the impact will be. And maybe it will be an impact way after we're gone, and we'll never know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So. <laughs> I mean, it, the, you know, the part, it, the one reason I'm really interested in Kara Walker's work is because I feel like, you know, there, there's a way in which and I think this is the reason it pisses a lot of people off, you know, kind of like the representations that she makes visible that are like in all of our hearts in a way. You know, I think that, you know, she, what she says is like, I don't, I don't know where these things come from, you know. And I remember as a child, like playing like little racist games with like, you know, the kids in the neighborhood, like tying this little white boy to a tree and whipping him. And I'm just like, where is it? It's like five years old, you know. And so, I w <laughs> like, and, you know, so there's something about the kind of like, <laughs> do you know, if I, if I, I hadn't seen Roots yet, you know, mm -hmm. but it's kind of, I'm interested in like, you know, just like how the imagination produces these images without our own consent. Like, what do we, you know, and I don't have an answer to that question. Like, what do we do about that? You know, is it, is it better to look at them? Is it better to see them? You know? One of the plays that I'm, one of my favorite playwrights is, um, is Adrian Kennedy, and she has this really wonderful one-act play called Funny House of a Negro. And there is this, in, in the play, it's an experimental play, and there is this haunting blackness that comes in the figure of the father. Um, but it's as if blackness has already been there and just needed somebody to la needed like people to latch it on to something or some group, right? You know, and um, you know there it is and there it gets latched on. But like now it's there and it's just like this like persistent, you know, threat or something. And so, you know, I am, you know, yeah, I'm just. Uh, even in the incremental or even in organizing, something that's very practical, it's like organizing people around a particular issue to do a certain thing, to make a certain policy change, that's like one thing, it has its effect. But then, you know, what happens to this other thing that's in us in this way that we don't necessarily have agency over? Yeah, I wanted to um, follow up on, on what Kara was saying about, the, the micro, and I think part, oftentimes part of the problem is that we are much, much better about talking about the macro, right? And then either not addressing the micro or um, <clears throat> at all, 
or um, addressing it in ways that don't necessarily mirror the macro, but nevertheless have some kind of relationship to it, right? So I do think that that um, um, individual and on the ground practices are, um, 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 are, are important. But I also, just going back to the original question, I also don't think that it's my responsibility as a black person to tell white people how to deal with race in 2015, to be very, very blunt about it, right? I appreciate the question, but it's also, it puts the burden on those folks who already have to um, 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 deal with it um, 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 constantly, right? And, um, and I think that it's a question you should ask and you should keep asking, but not necessarily um, expect answers that are like, um, what do you call those things? <laughs> Instruction. <laughs> Instruction manuals, thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> So let's uh, let's move away from the instruction manual. Um, what I what I was actually um, before I open the um, open the 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 conversation. Um, what what struck me, in particular with the latest publication by Michelle Wright, the physics of blackness. It just came out, so I don't assume that anybody has read it yet. But um, she's actually um, making a claim against the middle passage as the myth of uh, epistemol of our epistemologies. And I'm really curious what you think about that, and partic in particular because we're all, I used it, I used Glissant, the open boat in my introduction, but then when I go further back, um, as also just as a speculative moment here, and to open up um, the discourse to um, subjectivities within the black diaspora who don't um, connect to that particular moment in history. And I mean, I have my, there I have an answer, an answer <laughs> to that, um, in particular because, um, because of um, my background, which has like a very specific connection with the, with the Middle Passage, and nevertheless I use it, but I use it really literally as a metaphor for that particular way of being in that different world, which is constantly reproduced through systemic, institutional, um, um, and epistemological or epistemic uh, violence. So it's like the experience of not being present in the classroom, of not um, having my history narrated in um, the university, of uh, not seeing myself um, in a museum space, and I could go on and on and on, and in particular not uh, in popular culture in the contemporary. So what's, what's your thought on that? It's a it's a troubling what was the question. Last, the last sentence you said before you. The last sentence before, that I. Before, what's your thought on that? <laughs> <laughs> so what? Um, so what? I mean, maybe maybe I have to. Um, I don't remember. Um, so what? What did I say? Uh, help me out here. So basically. Yeah, not seeing yourself within, um, in not being included, but also not seeing yourself in that particular narrative, and nevertheless having that specific sensitivity. And I'm actually using this because, um, and that is very much inspired by one of the conversations that I had with um, Jasmine Morels, who created the piece uh, Shores, uh, sorry, created the piece Immortal Uterus that you can see upstairs in the exhibition, um, who was like. Uh, when I was talking about systemic violence um, and that this is like the link within the diasporas and this is also part of was part of my introduction but she said you know what there is so many beautiful positive narratives about the black diaspora I don't actually need the middle passage in order to make sense of myself and to connect with other black people around the world <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Um, I mean, I, th I think that there's kind of a conflation of different kinds of um, discourses about the Middle Passage. I mean, for me personally, I don't have any personal or familial connections that I know to the Middle Passage, but that doesn't mean, as a black person living in the West, that it doesn't affect me, right, in terms of the, um, 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 the, um, um, the after effects. So I think there's a really big difference in saying, and I mean, 
part of what Wright picks up on was this particular moment where there was a debate in the United States, especially when um, Obama came to the political forefront because before he became um, president, that he was not truly a black person because he was not middle class, um, not middle class <laughs> black. Um, he was not that either, but um, that's on another um, middle passage black. Um, my apologies. But I think that that also really, really misrecognizes what African America, for lack of a better term, is. I mean, there have always been other patterns of migration from the Caribbean, from Europe, from the African um, continent. And this has just um, 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 been um, magnified um, most um, um, in, 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 in the most recent developments. So to, to say that there is such a thing as a literal holding on to the middle, um, 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 the middle passage and being directly descendant from it, I don't really see it that much, but I do think that there, there is a critical emphasis on the Middle Passage precisely because it's not remembered in the same way that the Holocaust is remembered publicly, for instance, right? Um, and I don't, have, um, I don't necessarily have to have a direct connection, even though I do, to the Holocaust in order for, that, uh, for me to think that that affected me, right? I grew up in Germany, of course, in, in the post-World War II period. Of course, it affects me, whether I want to or not, and that's how I feel about um, the Middle Passage not as something that happened a few times, but that happened over a few hundred, um, 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 a, a, a few hundred um, years. And I do think that there, I mean, it's really, really complicated because of the way that that narrative sometimes gets played out in the public sphere. This was the, um, the debate that Wright picks up on was at Harvard, and it was about admissions and seeing that uh, most of the black students admitted to Harvard were first or ge second generation um, um, immigrants from especially West Africa, um, either um, Ghana or, um, um, or, 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 or Nigeria. And, um, and I think things need to be addressed and differences need to be, um, 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 need to be addressed. I'm not sure that the whole middle passage um, 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 question and um, as, as it's um, um, formulated in that way is really the way to, um, 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 the, the, the way to go, right? Um, that said, oh, I'm, I'll just stop there. I'm, I'm <laughs> rambling on and on. I'll give you all. I, I could talk about this. <laughs> I'm sure you want to say something, Don. Well, you know, I was just thinking about the, um, I was thinking about the kind of productive possibilities of irretrievability. And I think that, you know, because I'm a person who is really interested in two separate spheres, I'm interested in, you know, kind of um, um, lived trauma in a very literal sense, not in the kind of like, you know, popular academic, like, you know, tr trauma studies sense, you know? And, and I'm interested <laughs> in, you know, what it means to be a black queer woman and, you know, living primarily in the United States. And, and we, you know, when I bring those two things together, there, you know, so my um, family, you know, has no, you know, one assumes that, that, you know, because I know that my, you know, there are some people in my family who were sharecroppers that we were also slaves, et cetera, but there is really no history there to access. You know, when there's no history there to access, like what are you claiming? You know, it's just a bunch of poor black people just trying to get through the life, you know? So, <laughs> and you know, but, but when I, you know, so then I kind of like think about, you know, the experience, the lived experience of trauma in the body. And also there's something there too about, you know, like what happens when you can't tell your story? Um, because one of the things that happens, as many of you know, I'm sure, in the post-traumatic state is that you lose the kind of coherence of language. Mm -hmm. um, and so then what do you do? And so what I, the hopeful part, or the part that I really want to, I like thinking about, um, not only as a thought experiment, but also as a kind of, you know, something that animates the creative, is can those ways of existing in the moment be productive? Can the act of thinking about them through the creative create something else that we don't yet know? Um, and so, you know, I, I you know, because the, the option, uh, the other option is just to exist like, you know, in the moment of death. 
or something, right? In the moment of that which, you know, wh which is always the, the limited fragment as opposed to the, you know, I think Adorno's productive fragment. Um, so, yeah, I, I, that's my response. Well, I guess briefly, I would say, because you heard me talk about the Middle Passage, for me, it's a world historical event, <laughs> right, that I think um, continues to have uh, material consequences that are not just significant for African Americans, but that actually, um, you know, have something to do with the way that the geopolitics are structured right now and all of these other things. And so I think that there is a way that it's interesting as a metaphor. There's a way that it's interesting as a world historical event, right? And for me, too, the Middle Passage um, uh, is not, is, is, I think, you know, as Alex was saying, it's not something that just happened once, but it's also a way of marking something that we can talk about as a kind of temporality in a variety of other ways, which I tried to say, like the henceforward, the afterlife of slavery, all of these things, too, that don't mean that we have to have experienced it in our families or even know what it is to know that there's something that happened, <laughs> right, and that is still kind of happening. Well, thank you all three, because this is actually the beautiful link to um, to the diaspora where we are right now, and that's like something that uh, I wanted to emphasize with that troubling, troubling question. So I want to open up the floor um, for more questions. Don't be shy. Yes, Monica. <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking a second question. That's probably not fair, but. I'm just too uh, excited about what you're talking about. Um, I wanted to pick up on, on this notion of a subjectivity that's imagined from the position of the slave rather than the master. Um, and maybe ask you to offer some thoughts about the, the diasporic condition and the contemporary um, condition of slavery, actually. I'm living in Athens right now, and it's a place that, um, you know, is not only experiencing an economic crisis, but also a crisis in terms of human, um, human arrival that is not welcomed, <laughs> let's call it that way, and the Mediterranean is a graveyard that is kind of becoming something like the Black Atlantic that Paul Gilroy talks about. It's um, I think somehow disappearing in the discourse about the economic crisis. Um, and I was wondering within what you've sketched out, there's been Nana's proposal of the nothing, the no thing. And recently we had a vote in Greece and, the, and it was a, a no vote, ohi, right? Um, and it, it seemed to open up a kind of um, very interesting dimension of the no that is a refusal. Maybe not a negativity, but a refusal. Mm -hmm. Something that, that might be a little bit more productive than just simply a no. Mm -hmm. um, so just to pick out some of your different, uh, the different ways that you've brought up um, the abyss and negativity and the, and, um, refusals, and, and maybe I can just ask you to elaborate a bit of that in relation to this notion of sl the, the, the subjectivity of the slave. Well, I like, I like, um, I mean, I like the question and I like the framing of the question in relationship to what's happening today um, because I think that's something that we should all be thinking about <laughs> on some level, right? So, um, and the notion of the refusal um, is something that I've been trying to think through in, in this project, um, but in a different, in, well, actually in a, in a similar kind of way. Like, what are the options that open um, in this kind of configuration uh, if you're not going to, you know, be down with all of these other things like organizing and, you know, like, and think that, that there's some way that that's going to make the 
change. So I think, um, I think that for me that, and and so your question was about the refusal in relationship to this the subject of the slave. So one way I'd answer that without getting into a big long thing because I'm still writing it, so it'd be very convoluted for me to tell you this, but I'll go back to something I wrote previously, right, which is to say one of the things I have thought about is the way that, say, like the master-slave dialectic is so predicated upon staking one's life and being willing to die for something. I think this is part of what Alex was also pointing to, is to say that there's something about a kind of refusal that is about survival, that is sort of what happens in the face of, you know, um, limited range of options, that I think is sort of part of this, um, what opens up when one sits with, the, with, you know, those who have lived, what it means to survive, what it takes to survive sometimes, right? Um, and so I would, I would kind of situate some notion of the refusal within that constellation. Um, he, so what you, your, uh, what's been said just now between, uh, I'm just kind of listening across both of you, both the question and this, um, you know, uh, formulation of uh, Kara's, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the kind of, um, you know, this kind of inability to kind of like get out of like master-slave dialectic as akin to this inability of getting out of like the I-U dialectic, or maybe interesting to me is like the I-We dialectic, and you know, I think that there is something that is, um, you know, um, I, you know, I wish that we, could, I wish there were a, a kind of like synapse that we could have just like fried or something that would, <laughs> that would <laughs> make it so that we weren't making certain connections all the time. <laughs> um, or so that, you know, like the legibility of the way in which one experiences the other wasn't legible to like, you know, the, the one who's being read through another or something like that. I think that that would be a really powerful thing. Um, you, I, I, I want, uh, so anyway, so that's just like kind of like preamble, blah, blah, blah. But um, what I was thinking about when you were asking your question is the way in which um, the libretto that I wrote for um, uh, the, uh, how do you say, Yam and African uh, video, uh, good stock on the dimension floor came about was this kind of like imagining about the possibilities within the ten or however many dimensions there are, however many dimensions um, theoretical physicists theorize there are. Like, are there other possibilities for imagining oneself? Um, and so, you know, what I thought about was, you know, these three characters living in three very, very different dimensions and having that affect the way that they thought about racial existence. And there was, you know, there's one character in particular, Perpetuous, who has a real kind of freedom around that, that we here in like the lived world in this dimension, however many dimensions we experience here, do not have the luxury of experiencing, but what if? Yeah, maybe, maybe, oh no, I have my own, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> maybe I can you take, take you up on that, because that was something that I tried to emphasize with the notion of um, the acknowledgement or the realization that you're not a single being. And that is one of the key uh, phrases by Edouard Glissant, which actually has put me on a completely different journey. In particular, this this uh, notion of temporality that then um, Kara brings in, the notion of synchronicity of these different worlds. So what happens if these different non-single beings, so the multiplicity within ourselves that are bound to these different temporalities, these different histories, all play at the same time. And um, that for me 
me was the revelation when I saw Goodstock, and which was based on these three characters, which were all bound together, and which is why I, when I wrote about the the film, uh, called it an internal discussion, and that's where I see the option and the possibility and the beauty of this particular moment right now, because it's kind of disobedient uh, to the norm, to disobedient to the idea of the master. It's like, no, we're not interested in that conversation. Mm -hmm. We want to just like explore what's actually here and what these different, uh, what these multiplicities and synchronicities can produce for us right now in order to survive. No, and just to, um, um, to build on that and, and what was said um, um, before, when I said about the, um, that, about the, um, um, the slaves' humanity, I mean, what I was really um, saying was, and I think that we're really at a point now where it has become clear that so many of the politics and cultural um, 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 movements, they were never only that, but were about in some way accessing that master subjectivity and um, being, and that this has fundamentally, after so and so many hundreds of years, has not worked, right? Um, and to really look to places where there is that um, 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 refusal, like in Kay's novel, where there's not this idea, oh, that um, Joss slash Josephine should conform to a certain idea of what a black person, a black trans person, a black queer woman should be within that um, um, context, but out of necessity has to create these, um, 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 the, 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 these different um, 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 options. And I think that, um, there are all these ways in which it has become more and more um, um, clear that that is not really um, um, a path that has um, worked in any um, in, in, in any kind of um, way, right? Um, beginning with abolitionist discourse and continuing through various other um, um, freedom movements. As I said, that was never the only thing, but focusing on that particular aspect of um, um, inclusion and um, to a certain extent having to emulate these models of being human, of being gendered in particular kinds of ways, that that is something that has just fundamentally um, not worked and to, to um, yeah, embrace the, um, um, the, the, the refusals. Um, I'm very sorry, but I cannot take another question. Um, what I want to do, however, uh, because my uh, te ta temporal time, my, my politics of time actually became very bad, so we're very much over time now. Um, nevertheless, uh, I want to invite you to the reading upstairs in the gallery um, in memory of um, en Mitch Enriquez. And uh, so it will be about ten, ten minutes. Eight, an eight to ten minutes reading before we can refresh ourselves with beverages. I thank you all very, very much for coming for the beautiful questions. Please continue the conversation. I hope we had this was a starting point for all of us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>